Hi, this is Dr. Remenacker, and we are entering into the second video that focuses on graphing with asymptotes. There was a video made previous to this one, and it focuses on graphing with rational functions. Um, specifically, this one will move beyond that into graphing with exponential and logarithmic functions. In the previous video, we talked about three different types of asymptotes that can occur. Vertical asymptotes, horizontal asymptotes, and slant asymptotes. If we do a quick graph over here, hmm, well that's a little bigger than I would hope for. If we do a little graph over here, well, I guess we'll just go with that. Vertical asymptotes are, as the name implies, asymptotes that run vertically. Horizontal asymptotes are the, those that run horizontally and slant asymptotes run at an angle. They can either be increasing or they can be decreasing, but a slant asymptote will always be a line. It is possible to have vertical asymptotes as well as horizontal asymptotes or vertical asymptotes as well as slant asymptotes. Um, it's also possible to just have vertical asymptotes on a graph. So you don't have to have all three types of asymptotes on a graph at the same time. And in fact, you won't have all three. You will either have horizontal or slant, um, but you won't have both horizontal and slant. Let's take a look at some of the basic information that's useful to keep in mind when you're sketching a graph. It's listed down here. There are six different items you want to keep tabs of. The seventh one just says sketch the graph. The first one is compute the domain for both the function and the derivative. The domain of the function is important because in some cases a graph may only have a, um, use of a portion of the x-axis. So it might be something like that where it starts part way over. There are all kinds of things that can happen in a graph and you need to be aware of these. Computing the domain is a good start to get an idea of what's going on. The second thing to do is to compute or determine the location of the x and y intercepts. Remember x-intercepts occur where the y value is zero. and y-intercepts occur where the x value is zero. This will be useful. We'll go over this as we take a look at the various functions that we're going to be graphing here in a bit. Third thing to do is to locate any vertical, horizontal, or slant asymptotes if they exist. Really important, it's not necessary to have all types, or in some cases you won't have any of them. For example, if you have a graph that just does something like this, there aren't any asymptotes there. So it's possible that a function can have no asymptotes at all. What you want to do then is determine on what intervals the function is increasing, where it's decreasing. And as we talked about in an earlier section, in an earlier video, where are the critical values? Remember, the critical values can occur where the derivative is zero or undefined. Just because the, the derivative is zero or undefined doesn't mean that it is a critical value, as in a max or a min, okay? but it's a point that needs to be considered when looking for those. The next thing we want to look for is inflection points. Inflection points occur where the second derivative is zero or undefined. Then we want to locate the intervals where it's concave up and concave down. So notice we're going to have x and y intercepts. We're going to locate all the asymptotes. We're going to locate intervals where it's increasing, where it's decreasing. We're going to locate critical values. From that you can then determine the critical points critical value is just the x value. A critical point has the x value as well as the y value to give you a coordinate. We're going to locate inflection points. We're going to determine where it's concave up, concave down, and when you put all this information together, you actually get a really decent graph 
of the function. As a starting point, let's take a look at something like what we did in a previous video. We have a rational function here. Our function is y equals 2 over x squared minus 2x minus 8. Okay, so let's go after the various steps. The first thing we want to do is to locate the domain. And for right now, I'm just going to work on the function itself. So what I'm going to do right now is to look at the domain of y. Okay. And essentially, this is going to ask what values of x can be used. Well, keep in mind, our function in this case is 2 over, and wow, look at there. This thing factors into x minus 4 times x plus 2. This allows us to see that there are two values of x that we can't use. The two values of x that we can't use are x equals negative 2 and x equals 4. Okay, These are points where the function is undefined because you get a 0 in the denominator. So our domain is going to be the set of x from negative infinity to negative 2 along with negative 2 to positive 4 along with 4 to infinity using parentheses on all those because you cannot actually include any of those x values negative infinity negative 2 4 or positive infinity so there we have our domain taken care of number two on the list is to compute the x and the y intercepts so to compute the x intercept Remember, this means y equals 0. Well, in this case, that would mean we have 0 is equal to our function. And our function is, is 2 over x squared minus 2x minus 8. The only way a fraction can equal 0 is if the numerator is 0. Well, the only way you can get 2 to equal 0 is um, like never because 2 is not equal to 0. So that means that this graph is not going to have a situation where we have y equal to 0. It can't happen. And if y is not 0, there are no x-intercepts. Okay, so I'm going to start circling the information I want to keep tabs on. Here's my domain. The next thing I want to look at is the y-intercepts. Y-intercepts only occur where x equals 0. Now be really careful because lots of folks will see the x's in the denominator and say, ah, oh, when I plug those in, it goes to a 0 in the denominator and we've got undefined but that's not really true because what we have is 2 over a negative 8 or a negative 1 fourth so we do have a y-intercept at negative 1 fourth so there is a y-intercept and i'm going to go ahead and i'm going to put that on my graph right now okay so i'm going to come over here to a negative one fourth, and I'm going to label this as zero comma negative one fourth. There's my y-intercept before I lose track of it. All right, so what we're going to do now, we've got step two taken care of. Step three says to locate vertical, horizontal, and slant asymptotes if they exist. Okay, so let's go through the various asymptotes. The easiest ones to do are vertical, so VA for vertical asymptotes. These occur where the function um, has a zero in the denominator. We already have the function factored out. It's at the top of the screen right now. 
you can see that there are vertical asymptotes at x equals negative 2 and x equals 4. These two values came from right here, the x minus 4 zeroes out when x equals 4, and the x plus 2 zeroes out when x is a negative 2. Well, I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to locate these on my graph as well so I don't lose track of them. So here's negative 1, here's negative 2, put that there, come over 1, 2, 3, here's positive 4, like that, and I'm going to draw some dashed lines in just to remind me that, hey, these are my asymptotes. Now, the thing to notice here is these asymptotes coincide with our domain. Notice our domain includes all x values except negative 2 and positive 4. So we've accounted for our domain with these vertical asymptotes. The vertical asymptotes do not allow us to take on a value of x equals negative 2 or x equals positive 4. Horizontal asymptotes are situations where we do the limit as x approaches infinity of our function and the limit as x approaches negative infinity of our function. We'll see situations where the positive infinity and the negative infinity yield different values for the limit. In this case, okay, if we go back to our function, and we substitute in positive infinity into our function. We're going to have 2 over infinity squared. Well, 2 over infinity squared is going to wind up giving us a value of 0. When we evaluate the limit at negative infinity, if we take negative infinity and we start squaring really big negative numbers, that once again gives us a positive value, and we have 2 over some really big positive value. So that gives us 0. This tells us that we have a horizontal asymptote at y equals 0. I'm going to go over to the graph, and I'm going to put a dashed line right here at the x-axis. This is at y equals 0. There is an asymptote there. The third type of asymptote that we want to consider is the possibility of a slant asymptote. Slant asymptotes only occur when the exponent in the numerator is 1 degree higher than the exponent in the denominator. Well, in this case, the higher exponent is in the denominator, which means we don't have any slant asymptotes. They do not exist. So that has that taken care of. OK, so going back to our checklist, man, there are quite a few things on here. Next up, we want to locate where the function is increasing, decreasing, and has critical values. This occurs where the derivative is 0 or the derivative is undefined. Oh my, that means we have to take the derivative of this function. Yep, you got it. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to look for my critical values. I need to compute what the derivative is. Now, what's going to wind up happening here is we're going to do f prime times g, <clears throat> okay, which is going to give us f prime is 0 because the derivative of 2 is 0. doesn't matter what this is, but it's a minus 2x minus 8. Then we have minus. Then we're going to have 2 times the derivative of the numerator, going back up to our, or our, our denominator, the derivative of the denominator is going to be 2x minus 2. And it's going to be over the denominator, which is x squared minus 2x 
minus 8 squared. Okay, so it's time for some algebra here. Our derivative <clears throat> okay, so doing some algebra razzle-dazzle, we can simplify the derivative. Notice the first term in the numerator is times 0, so that's all gone. All I need to do is for the second term in the numerator is distribute the negative 2 times the 2x. That's going to give us a minus 4x. The negative 2 times the negative 2 is going to give me plus 4. And it's going to be over this x squared minus 2x minus 8 squared. Now recall, at this point, we are working for critical values. Critical values occur at two locations. The critical values occur where the function is 0. That means our minus 4x plus 4 equals 0 which gives us x equals 1, or they occur where the denominator is 0, which is going to be where our x squared minus 2x minus 8 equals 0. However, these are our vertical asymptotes. We already have those on the graph. Okay, so the new piece of information we have here is our critical value. From that, I'm going to compute a critical point. That critical point has an x value of 1 and a y value of, uh-oh, it's time to get out the calculator. And strangely enough, I already have the calculator set up. Notice for y1, as usual, I have put in the original function. And for y2, I have put in the derivative. So I'm going to go to the table. I want the y value at x equals 1. So I'm just going to enter 1. The y value here is a negative 0.22222. So this is going to take a little more space. It's going to be negative 0 0.222 like that. I'm going to come back up to my graph and I have to be careful. Let's think about this. I already have an intercept at negative one-fourth. So I'm kind of wondering, I wonder if the calculator rounded something off or what the deal is. So I'm going to come up to my original function and I'm going to substitute one into that original function. And I'm just going to do the work off to the side here. So I'm going to get two over one minus two minus eight. which is a 2 ninths. Okay, so at x equals 1, I am at a negative 2 ninths, which is slightly more positive than a negative 1 fourth, because a negative 1 fourth is a negative 0.25. So at 1, I'm going to be, and I'm putting a point in right there, and I'm going to label this as the point 1 comma negative 0 0.222. This is why you label your points. I seriously doubt that any of you could look at that point and say, yep, I can see it. The y value is a negative 0.22222. Yeah, that's not going to happen. Okay, so you need to label these points for obvious reasons. With our first derivative, we then want to locate where is the function increasing and decreasing. If you go back up to this checklist, notice it says locate where the function is increasing or decreasing and has critical values. Well, what I'm going to do is underneath my graph, going to draw a line. I'm going to label this as f prime. I've got something going on at negative 2. There's something going on at 1. And then we also found something going on at 4. 
what I want to do here is I want to evaluate the derivative on the intervals between these points of interest. So I'm just picking some value here between negative 2 and 1. I'm going to pick some value between 1 and 4 and some value bigger than 4. Then what I'm going to do is I'm going to go on my calculator and I'm going to substitute in negative 3. I'm going to substitute in 0. And I'm going to move the calculator over to the left hand side so I can see what I'm doing. I'm going to substitute in 2 and then the value 5. Now this time we've got to be careful because we do not have an interest in the y values. What we want are the slopes, which is the derivative. All I'm interested in is it positive or negative. Well, at negative 3, it's greater than 0. Moving to the next one, at 0, it's also positive. Moving to the next one, notice at 2 and at 5 both it's negative. So I'm just going to go ahead and put both of those in. Less than 0, less than 0, which means that here it is increasing. On this interval it is increasing. On this interval it is decreasing. And on this last interval it is decreasing. Notice increasing and decreasing do not need to alternate back and forth. Okay, on to the next thing. Locate the inflection points. Notice we've finished number four. Locate the inflection points. Recall these occur where the second derivative is zero, where the second derivative is undefined. Oh my, that means I now need to take my first derivative and I'm going to put a little box right here and I'm going to compute my second derivative. I'm going to look for the inflection points. Okay, so the inflection points mean the second derivative is 0 or undefined. Well, my second derivative here is going to be a real joy because I've got to take the derivative of Oh yeah, I got to take the derivative of this. That might take a little doing and it might take a little more space than what's allotted right there. So I'm going to move things over. My second derivative here is going to equal. The denominator is going to be this x squared minus 2x minus 8. If it's squared and then squared again, it's going to be to the fourth power. In the numerator, I'm going to have the derivative of the first derivative's numerator. Well, that's going to be a minus 4 times this x squared minus 2x minus 8 squared minus, and then I'm going to have this minus 4x plus 4 times the derivative of the denominator. That's a chain rule. It's going to be 2 times the x squared minus 2x minus 8, and that's going to be times 2x minus 2. And then I need one more parenthesis to close off this parenthesis so everything is balanced out. Yep, that looks like fun. Okay, so what do we do from here? Well, what we're going to wind up doing here after we finish crying, is to square out the first thing. And what we're going to wind up with is a negative 4 times. To square that out, i got to FOIL that. So I'm going to have a whole lot of terms here. I'm going to have my x squared minus 2x minus 8 times this x squared minus 2x minus 8. 8. When I 
multiply those out, I'm going to get an x to the fourth. Then I'm going to take this x squared times this, which is going to give a 2x cubed. It's a negative 2x cubed. Then I'm going to take this, and I'm going to get a minus 8x squared. Now I start distributing this. This is going to be a minus 2x cubed. It's going to be a plus 4x squared plus 16x. Then I'm going to take the 8 and distribute it, and that's going to give a minus 8x squared plus 16x plus 64. Now I'm going to add each of these things up. So this is going to give us a minus 4x cubed. Then it's going to give us minus 8x squared plus 4. So that's going to be a minus 4x squared. Minus 8x squared is going to be a minus 12x squared. Adding up the 16s, so that gives plus 32x plus 64. So there's that part done. It just takes a little time. It's not horrible or beyond your capabilities algebraically. Now what we're going to do is we're going to do minus and yeah this looks like fun to multiply out. I'm going to work the algebra out down in the same area that I just did the first term in the numerator and I'm going to do two items at once. The first item I'm going to do is I'm going to take this times that because that's fairly straightforward to do. We have a minus 4x times a minus 2x. So that's going to give us a minus 8x squared. Then we're going to have the minus 4x times a minus 2, which gives us 8x. And we also have the 4 times the 2, which gives us another 8x. That gives us plus 16x. <clears throat> now we have the 4 times the negative 2 is going to be a minus 8. So it's that times, I'm going to distribute to 2 times this quadratic. And when I distribute to 2, I'm going to get 2x squared minus 4x minus 16. Okay, so now I'm back to doing what we had just done for the first term when we squared things out. I'm going to take and multiply those two together, which is going to give a minus 16x to the fourth. Okay, then what I'm going to do is I'm going to take this minus 8x squared times the next two terms, which is going to give 32 x cubed plus looks like 128 x squared okay I want to check that quick like 8 times 16 don't want to go making any mistakes yes then I'm going to distribute the 16 x the 16 x times the 2 x squared is going to be oh looks like about 32 x cubed and then times the minus 4x is going to be minus 64x squared. Then 16 times 16 is 256x. And that's going to be a minus 256x. So that has the 16x distributed. Now I'm going to take the negative x times each of these. Okay, you can do this. It's just a matter of sticking with the algebra. I'm moving this up a little bit here. The minus 8 times this is going to be a minus 16x squared. The minus 8 times the minus 4x is going to be plus 32x. The minus 8 times the minus 16 is going to be a positive 128. Okay, so I'm going to add all these up. Notice I have plus 64x cubed. Now, let's see here. The minus 64x squared and the minus 16x squared is 
a minus 80. Plus 128 is going to give me plus 48x squared. The minus 256x plus 32 is going to be a minus 224, it looks like. Minus 224x. And then we still need this plus 128. So we have that. Trying to save space, I'm going to erase this. Kind of got myself into a space dilemma here. It's all going to be over. Remember, we squared the square. So this is going to be an x squared minus 2x minus 8 to the fourth. Hmm. OK. Still working on the derivative of the derivative, or the second derivative. I'm going to start combining like terms. My denominator is going to be this x squared minus 2x minus 8 to the fourth. Be really careful in this first term. Notice it's this minus 4 times all this stuff. OK, I'm going to do the minus 4 times this is what's going to give me a minus 4x to the fourth plus, plus because we have the minus, the minus, plus 16x to the fourth, which is going to give us 12x to the fourth. I'm going to take the minus 4 times this minus 4x cubed, which is going to be a plus 16x cubed minus 64x cubed minus 48x cubed. I'm going to take the minus 4 times the minus 12x squared, which gives us a positive 48x squared minus 48x squared. Hooray, those cancel out. Next, going to take this minus 4 times the 32, which gives a minus 128x. So I'm going to have this minus 128x. From that, I'm going to add, or to that, I'm going to add 224, because it's minus the minus, which gives plus 96 x. Last thing we're going to do here is going to be the negative 4 times the 64. Well, that's going to be a positive or a negative 256. Sorry about that. It's going to be a negative 256. Then we're going to have minus 128, which gives us a negative or minus 384. Oh, yeah. This looks like fun. There are two places where this second derivative is undefined. Those two places occur where the denominator equals 0. And that's at uh, the same places we keep coming up with, x equals negative 2 and x equals 4. Okay, So those are already accounted for on our graph. For our second derivative, we now need to figure out, gosh, where does this numerator equal 0? Now, on a test, quiz, something or other like that, I would not give you this horrendous of a problem. Okay, But we can chase this down. Really? Yeah. To determine where this equals 0, Okay. I'm going to take and run to Wolfram Alpha. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to pull up on the computer, go to a new site, go to WolframAlpha.com. Yours would be a situation where... It's like a quadratic or something like that in a numerator. But what we're going to have is this 12x raised to the fourth minus 48x raised to the third plus 96x, that's just x, 
minus 384. And I want to solve where does that equal zero? Wolfram Alpha is really nice about this stuff. Aha. Well, this is interesting. This gives us some really good news here. Notice two of the results are imaginary numbers. That means we don't have to worry about those. The other two results are at x equals negative 2 and x equals 4. That should sound kind of familiar. Been there, done that. Okay, so what's going to wind up happening is when I come back to draw a line with my second derivative, things are going to be happening at negative 2 and at 4. At this point, we want to take our second derivative, and just like we did with the first derivative, we want to evaluate it on each of the intervals between the points that we've identified as being potential inflection points. Okay, so there, got that. As I did before, I'm going to pull up the calculator. I'll move it over to the uh, left here so we can see what's going on. Notice, oh wow, hey, check it out. Already has y3 located in the y equals. So I'm going to go to the table. And now I'm going to check, let's see, are any of these numbers already on here? Uh, it doesn't look like it. Uh, well, yeah, negative 3 is. Now on negative 3, what I'm interested in is not y1, y2, but I'm interested in y3. At this location, it's greater than 0. Then I'm going to pull up the calculator again. And at 0, I'm looking at y3. It's negative. So I'm going to, on my line here, put down that it's negative. I'm going to pull it up a third time, and at 5, I'm going to look at y3, and there it is positive. Okay, so we have information about increasing, decreasing. We now have information about concavity. Here it's concave up because it's positive. Here it's concave down, negative. Here it's concave up. Okay, well, we've got that taken care of. Notice on our checklist, we've got our intervals for concave up, concave down. It's time to sketch the graph. What I'm going to do is I'm going to use my information about concavity and about increasing, decreasing to come up with something over here. On that interval, it is concave up and it is increasing. Well, in order for it to be concave up and increasing, it would either go like this, which doesn't make any sense because it would be crossing asymptotes, or it's going to do something like this, which fits very nicely in there with the asymptotes. Our next interval is this one right here. It's concave down, but increasing. Now remember, it is increasing toward this location right here. And remember, it continues to increase all the way over to x equals 1. So we've got it through those two points. I'll try to draw on that maybe a little better. It's going to come up something like this. It levels off, hits there. Then notice from 1 to 4, it is decreasing and it continues to be concave down. Decreasing concave down is going to go, well, let's keep this in the same color, is going to go like that. On our next interval from 4 to infinity, it is concave up. Okay and it's decreasing. Well, concave up and decreasing doesn't fit 
down below the x-axis very well because first off it doesn't follow the horizontal asymptote and secondly it crosses that but it's going to wind up going like this on these two ends here and here if you're not exactly sure what's going on with it what you can do is you can pull your calculator back up you can go to y1 now at negative 3 okay looking over at the calculator in the table at negative 3 the y value is 0.28 so at negative 3, negative 3 would be something like right here, 0.28 is above the x-axis. That's going to put it up there. It can't be below the x-axis. If we move over to our far right interval and we look at x equals 5, at x equals 5, oh, look. The y value is positive. So if I move over to x equals 5, which is something right here, the y value is going to put us up in here again. And you can see that we can't be below the x-axis for either of these two end intervals. Whew. There's a graph of the function. This takes some time. Okay. If you need a break, go ahead and take a break. I am going to stop this video because this one's already up to about 45 minutes. I'm going to stop this video and I will continue on in a next video.